math as music, John Coltrane, and Einstein. I am in way over my head. Stefan Alexander clarifies all. Up next on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and today we're going to shake things up a bit and look at music and physics with Dr. Stefan Alexander, professor of physics at Brown University. Hello, Stefan. Hi. Thank you for being here. It's great to be here. Stefan, your book, Jazz of Physics, has a very intriguing subtitle, which is The Secret Link Between Music and the Structure of the Universe. Now, I mean, I know the link between music and the structure of my Saturday night, but the universe, I mean, what, does, what does that mean? Well, your Saturday night. <laughs> I, so my field of study is cosmology, and we try to understand the large scale structure of the universe, basically you know, going beyond our solar system, going beyond our galaxies, so many galaxies, and looking basically at the entire collection of objects of, of galaxies and stars and planets and, and ultimately people. So in a lot of ways, to kind of understand who we are and our place in the universe, um, the same way a biologist might study the structure of the human body, right? Um, we want to understand the structure of the entire universe. One of, one of the elements in music, actually, is structure. So, and we, you know, in my book, I go into, into that and the similarities and differences between the structure in the universe and in physical law. The laws of physics themselves also have a beautiful structure as well as um, structure and music, and how they may be related to each other. And you, you've talked about how a series of notes changed the focus of your research. What were those notes? Those, the series of those notes um, were the head, what we call the beginning melody of John Coltrane's Giant Step. You know, when I first heard it as a teenager, I had this intuition, I had this sense, and I was only 16 years old, that there was some kind of hidden code or hidden pattern that informed Coltrane, you know? Because, you know, if you listen to Giant Steps, the head, I uh, played for you. I love it when the a horn. cosmologist plays me the saxophone. Well, you know, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> so what I'll just do is I'll play three notes, and then I'll play the head. <laughs> now, now let me play the head. What I just played, the first thing I played were three notes. Those three notes made up something called a triad, which is just basically a scale made up of three notes. Those three notes um, have a specific name. It's called an augmented triad. All right? And it turns out that if you draw those notes on a circle, right, so we can basically um, take a clock, 12, you know, from 1 to 12, mm -hmm. equally space points uh, around that circle, and I can then put all the notes on, on the piano, right, from, you know, there's 12 notes. Um, and it turns out that if you draw a completely symmetric equilateral triangle, it creates those three notes. Those are the three notes that make that up. So that's called a symmetric scale, and that is a very special geometry in that, that, that those notes make up a symmetry, meaning that it's a symmetric, right, geometry. So yeah, Coltrane was playing geometry. But did he know it? Yes, he did know it. You know, when I decided that I wanted to write this book, I ended up interviewing various people, like the great composer and musician David Amram, who was a composer for, New, I believe, the New York Philharmonic. He and Coltrane were friends. And he told me that Coltrane um, was a big fan of Albert Einstein and that he would study, he, he was studying geometry and all those other things. So yeah, so it goes on and on, but Train was very hip to that as well. So, so let's bring Youssef Latif into the conversation. Mm -hmm. If, if you're taking notes, Youssef Latif was a Grammy Award-winning composer and jazz musician, and in 2010, he received the NEA's Jazz Master Fellowship Award. But before that, in 1961, Youssef Latif received a birthday gift from John Coltrane 
that the world is still talking about today. So between Coltrane and Latif, this diagram was a was a conversation about the similarities in musical scales, mm -hmm. and you saw Einstein in it. Absolutely. Why? Where? Well, to go there, I have to say a little bit about what Einstein did for us. Physicists and astronomer and philosopher, we've been struggling for 2,500 years of human, um, you know, to try to understand a couple of things. Why are the planets moving the way they're moving? You know, um, trying to understand actually what gravity really is how space and time relates to gravity. In other words, what, what's really making the planets go around the sun? So Newton had a piece of the puzzle solved, but it, which is in the 1600s, but it took all the way till you know, the early 1900s for Albert Einstein to crack the code. And what Einstein discovered, you hear, um, of course, we call this a theory of relativity, because we talk about the theory of relativity as if everything is relative. Mm. Actually, Einstein didn't like the, the, that labeling, relativity. He actually preferred the theory of invariance. If I, give you, if I present a circle to you, and then I tell you, close your eyes, and you close your eyes, and I rotate the circle, but you don't know I did that, but I rotate the circle, and you open your eyes, right, you'll still see the same object, yeah. right? So... I transformed, or I, I changed this object, and it remained the same. So that object, there's an invariance, all right? There's an invariance um, with respect to change in the object, and that is an aspect of symmetry. So what Einstein really discovered was that the fundamental laws of gravity and space and time itself had an invariance, all right? Had a hidden symmetry. That symmetry revealed itself by the invariance of the speed of light, the fact that light no matter how fast one person is moving, relative to another person, it doesn't matter. They both will measure the speed of light to be the same. That is the invariance. And that forever changed physics. In fact, all of the other forces that, that people discovered, you know, how they operated, like Richard Feynman later on, mm -hmm. and the other nuclear forces, were also based on this idea, this breakthrough idea of invariance. So what Coltrane was trying to do with his diagram was to also explore the, the invariance. Whenever I use the word invariance, we should say symmetry. Okay. All right, because a symmetric object is invariant uh, under the various ways you may change it. You say invariance, I say symmetry. I got it. That's right. Okay. Perfect, yes. Um, I'm going to have to use that in my class. Try me, try me. Okay, you say, okay, what's invariance? Symmetry. Okay. Beautiful. I'm with you. And you, did, you put your hands up like this, and that's symmetric, right? Ah, that's a bilateral it, symmetry. It is. What that diagram does, it, re, it, it, it basically relates different types of scales on, in, in the symmetric representation that he drew. You can swap the scales, you can reflect and rotate, and this object that he drew will remain the same. Just like I have different observers and the speed of light is the same. All right, let's talk about the overlaps of jazz and science, um, beginning with improvisation. So we usually often, you know, colloquially think of improvisation as wide open, like mm -hmm. anything goes. But in jazz, that's not really the case, is it? Um, it's not really the case. I mean, certainly for like certain geniuses, you know, <laughs> they, they can just undergo some spontaneous emission and what they'll create is breathtaking and beautiful and mind-blowing. But for most models, like, you know, like myself, um, there, there are guiding principles and structures um, in jazz music and performance and practice that we adhere to. So there are, you just don't go up and just play any old thing. There's a vocabulary, there are structures, um, and we definitely borrow a lot from the past masters, and it's an ongoing practice. It's harder than physics. Is it really? For me it is. It, why? It's kind of personal. I think I'm a little bit natural, I'm naturally a little bit better at physics. Um, do jazz and physics call on different parts of your brain? Oh, it feels that way, but, but also it calls on similar parts of my brain as well. And what are the similar parts? The similar parts, for me, trying to find patterns. So, you know, you get up there and you're improvising, and the, the, you know, things are happening so fast, and um, you have to make decisions in a split second when you, you, it's, you, know, when you make a mistake. When you're playing, is that what you're saying? You're making you're decisions playing. all the time. I, yeah. don't think, I don't think the mortals who can't play an instrument like you think of you as being up there making decisions. We think you're just like in the zone, man. Oh, yeah, so what I mean by making a decision is in the zone. Okay. It, it, it's a combination of your, 
Yeah, it's sort of like um, you're walking on a tightrope, right? Okay. But there's a map. There is a kind of mental map of how the chords are changing, what the rhythmic structure is. There are certain things that you know ahead of time and that you put a lot of time ahead of time into practicing, right? However, um, that preparation time before you go and you play a song, let's say, you're really trying to, and this is the similarity. You see, at first glance, physics may seem to be this futile, very dif difficult thing. But a good physicist, we really try to strip it down to the simplest, dumbest thing possible. <laughs> and that process in trying to strip things down to its, simple, you know, its simplest components, or just have the conceptually stupid way of understanding something, is what we try to do, what I try to do as a, as a, um, a, a student of jazz. There might be something that appears to be very daunting, you know, or a solo that I'm transcribing from another musician. And what I'm really trying to do is to find the simplest way of seeing that. And in that way, um, it's, they're, they're both similar and attractive to me. Is, is the jazz solo an algorithm? Yes, in some ways it is an algorithm. Can you uh, define algorithm in, in sort of musical terms, how it would apply to a jazz solo? Well, I think that process of basically taking something that appears to be very complicated, right, and finding the simple rules underlying it, I mean, that process, um, in that process, you're going to find an algorithm. You're going to find a method, okay, or a set of instructions that tell you how, that, how to represent and how to, or how to recreate that, that complexity from the simple thing that you may or may not discover. You know, as, as you sort of explain that improvising in jazz isn't just, isn't just a, a free-for-all, it makes me think of the phrase close enough for jazz, that it must be really actually sarcastic, right? It is sarcastic. But let me actually say that it's important, though, it is important, though, that especially, you know, you know for young people that get into something like jazz music or improvise, like to improvise, I think it's more important to actually get up there and just be free and play um, without, at first, maybe worrying about those rules. I mean, I think that the inspiration and the joy of actually getting up there and being included to play with others who may be more skilled than you and being a part of it and being welcomed in yeah. is way more important, all right? I mean, those other things, it's endless. I mean, so you, you can spend 50,000 lifetimes you know, exploring this, this field called jazz or physics. And, and that kind of fearlessness um, allows you room to make mistakes, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Miles Davis in telling Herbie Hancock in, in life as in music, there are no mistakes. Yes. Uh, does, does that apply to science? For me, big time it applies to science. I come from a, you know, a life of mistakes, you know, I, I, you know, where I grew up and how I got into science and, and so much of if you were to call success that I, you know, if you want to call that success, actually didn't come from um, a plan in something. It actually, there were mistakes involved and those, the mistakes and knowing how to, how to um, use those mistakes in constructive ways and how to learn from the mistakes and how to take advantage of them played a major role in where I'm at as a scientist. How do you turn what's a mistake in science into a new direction? Yeah, that's good. I mean, something I'm actually exploring right now with my, with my, with my teaching. So one of the things that, um, you know, when I, when I was a professor at Haverford College, um, they, they're very keen on teaching. In fact, like, my senior colleagues um, would sit in my class and, like, um, would sit in my class and take crazy notes, right, and then critique me on the fine points. This is when I was, uh, you know, this is probably, like, several years ago. And one of my um, senior colleagues, Walter Smith, uh, he came and he's a very, you know, very nice guy, but very gentlemanly, and he, and he broke down the news to me. He goes, he said, you know what? You missed a great opportunity. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you made a mistake on the board, on the blackboard when you're doing that, and you were trying to hide it, he said to me. He said, that is the moment to, to truly teach. Mm. He said, when you made that mistake and you recognize it, that's when you, you show the students, you admit the mistake, and then you say, oh, look at this. Why did I make this mistake? And then the, and go through the process of how to, how to change that mistake into the correct answer. That demonstration sh teaches so much, but what it also does, it empowers the student and shows them, hey, look, I'm this, you know, 
PhD, da da da, physicist guy, and I, I still make mistakes, but the important thing is to catch it and then turn those lemons into lemonade. So in my research and with my graduate students and my students now, I deliberately make mistakes on the blackboard. Actually, it actually still happens, right? <laughs> but I definitely embrace that, and I really encourage students um, to embrace making mistakes. And um, really, it's really important in terms of like making progress. Sometimes those mistakes, well, for me, oftentimes those mistakes lead to new insights and new discoveries. I, if you pay attention to them. I am going to start calling all my mistakes. I'm, I'm just going to say I'm improvising. I'm just improvising, everybody. <laughs> Turn it around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, no, that's perfect. Stefan, I, I'm a huge fan of, of language and words, and I can totally understand how a sentence can be the cornerstone of language. But can you help me understand how there are sentences in either music or, or math? Um, yeah. Could you play? Is there, a, is there a sentence in music that you could play? Yeah, I'll just play. I'll... I'll what I'll do is I'll just, I'll just spontaneously play something and see if a sentence comes out of it. Okay, so I, one sentence I think I played was something I So that was a sentence. That's a sentence. What is and a sentence? It's, it's no, it's more of a phrase. I would say that's a, you know when we think about first of all the analogy between you know linguistics or um, language and music, you know obviously it's very limited, but it's a it's you know it, it's a decent analogy. You know so we have letters, and letters come together to make up words. Words come together, right, to make up phrases, right? And then these phrases with a syntactical structure can make up a, you know, a sentence maybe. So we can think of notes, the notes um, as your, you know, your, your letters in an alphabet. You know, it makes up an alphabet. Um, and when you bring these notes together, right, you can form a phrase, right? And then these packets of phrases can be strung together, all right? to make up, you know, to express a musical sentence, all right? So in that sense, um, the analogy goes. So those four notes, ba ba da ba dee ba 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 da ba dee ba I mean, Charlie Parker uses that a lot, you know. I mean, if you listen, if you really listen to a lot of jazz songs, you'll hear that phrase in a lot of, um, in a lot of um, jazz solos. Um, and so we borrow that from each other, just like, for me to learn language from my parents, I do just borrow phrases without even understanding what they mean. But it, I understand what I'm trying to express, but theoretically, um, I don't know anything about grammar as a kid, right? Yeah. So, but we, we mimic, right? And so actually, that, that's why it's very important for jazz musicians and scientists, actually, is that um, to, we mimic each other. We, we mimic each other's styles, right? How do you mimic in, in science? Hmm? How do you mimic? phrases in science? How do, you, how do you take a style in science and, and mimic it? There are different ways to do that. I mean, I can only speak about me and my students or my, pred my people that taught me physics. I mean, there's a, I would say that most of the physics I learned, I didn't learn in, in the classroom. But classrooms is important. I mean, it's very important to, to go to class. <laughs> <laughs> Says the professor, yes. Um, I learned it, I learned it from, from um, hanging out with um, other physicists. So, one thing that um, we do a lot is we talk to each other a lot. We, um, and this is very another similarity between, between jazz and, and physics. So like in jazz, you have, you have a group of individuals. They may meet for the very first time, you know, or maybe have played a few times before. They call a tune, right? And then they start playing together and improvising together. Um, so there's a group dynamic there you know, where maybe the band, the rest of the band, supports or creates a, st a structure for the person who was soloing, who was improvising, to play. And then the other person gets a chance to solo, right? Um, but actually, there's a group dynamic going on. If someone plays something, there's a, there's a call and response. The other players are going to respond to that. Um, 
then it's bi-directional as well. Just like in, in so like theoretical physics research, we do, very, we do that too. I might be discussing an idea or a concept or some equations with, a, with my students, say, and I'll say something, and the student will take that, mm -hmm. and they'll say, um, well, that's interesting, and they'll throw their own thing back at me. This is like improvisational yeah, comedy, like a, too. It's all this it's, notion of improvising, and we're in so building how, how, how does that work? That's really interesting. In improvisational comedy, somebody, somebody throws out an idea as preposterous as she wants it to be, and if you're in a comedy troupe, you can't say, no, an elephant wouldn't sell me ice cream. You say, yes, and now, you know, here comes a lactose intolerant donkey. What's going to happen? You know what I mean? You have to keep adding to the scene, but, but somebody started a thread that you need to be faithful to. A so. lactose intolerant I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's, that's real um, improvisation right there. Um, that's exactly, so that's right. So, that, so what I do with my students, sometimes I will just say the dumbest thing that comes to my mind. We'll, get, we'll be stuck on something. I'm good at that. And I, well, I'm bad at it, but I'm trying to be good at it. Um, but I'll say the dumbest thing. And then the student, they wouldn't know what to do with it because they're thinking, well, what the heck is this guy? We're supposed to be talking about this kind of physics. But what I do is try to create an environment where that's okay. And then we use that as a generative type of structure to go somewhere interested in the research. Things that are beautiful in art often have a kind of scientific counterpart. You know, I'm thinking of the, the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence. And I think... I think most people understand that in art, but what makes it beautiful in science? That's a good question, and it's actually a hard question. <laughs> um, you know, the idea of beauty in, in, in science differs from person to person. Some people think, you know, well, the more complicated and more brilliant I get to express, that's beautiful. But for me, physics, the reason why physics in particular, and this I d also applies in a lot of science, sci sciences as well, is the beauty is in the simplicity. The fact that you have a simple idea, okay? Newton's second law, right, which says an object, right, will remain at rest, right, or we will remain in constant motion. I mean, that it's, if, a, if an object is moving at the same velocity, right, at a constant velocity, it will remain like moving at that velocity uninterrupted forever and ever and ever. If an object is not moving, it will remain there forever and ever and ever. What makes objects change their motion, either accelerate from not moving at all or accelerate while it's moving, is if there's an applied force. Believe it or not, that may appear to be very... Um, um, obvious to a lot of people, but Nowadays, it, it took 2,000 right. years of great minds, you know, Aristotle, Plato, Copernicus, Ptolemy, you know, Kepler. No one got it. Galileo, right? Isaac Newton understood this. That equation, that idea, could be formulated into a very simple equation. And that equation works, okay, um, for land and airplanes, to send in space shuttles into outer space, to explain how planets go around the sun, it explains a whole lot of physics, that one simple idea. And to me, that is beautiful. The power for a simple idea to apply across, across a wide range of situations. And now I see why that, that, I, I, the counterpart of that is jazz, that, that a, a phrase, some notes that all That's these right. different people can join in and riff on. Yeah, my music mentor, Orna Coleman, once told me, he picked up this, his white saxophone and he goes, you know what's interesting? There are only eight notes <laughs> to play here. Of course, if you listen to Ornan Coleman, right? I mean, what he's doing, you know, good luck trying to do that, right? <laughs> but actually, his point is uh, well taken, right? Yeah. Uh, th there are only eight, th these eight notes. So why aren't scientists as cool as musicians? Is this a huge cultural mistake? Yeah, I think it's, it's a huge mistake. Um, I, I think it's a huge media mistake because scientists are as cool as musicians, okay? Scientists, we're, you know, we, I agree. We, come, we come with our, the first thing is that I think, you know, um, scientists, at least the ones, I mean, like, for example, my first PhD advisor, Leon Cooper, who won the Nobel Prize for superconductivity. And so he's this gargantuan of a figure in physics, right? When I w first started grad school, I didn't know, because there was this guy that wore fancy Italian suits, right? And fancy, like, shades, with like slick back, you know, you know, hair 
and drove ni a nice cars, he right? He was a scientist. And he was a physicist. He was a scientist. So he's a cool guy. Um, so, you know, we just as, but I think what the media is very good at, it portrays a very a cross section of scientists that act and talk and look a certain way. Um, but, you know, a lot of scientists I know, we're just human, we're people, you know? Stefan, thank you for illuminating all of this. Can you, can you play a few seconds more of, of your saxophone before we, have to, before we have to wind this down? Sure. And by the way, as a jazz musician, I hope you're called the professor. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> idea, maybe. <laughs> That's all we have time for today. Whatever we can't fit into this half hour, we'll share in our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab or download our app to keep up with everything related to Science Goes to the Movies all in one place.